Hi, I'm Sue Erdman, and I'm here to talk about the standard of care. But first, I want to thank Rich for having us and letting us, this is our first chance to kind of talk about our results all together, and um, to thank Craig and Bobby for roping me into this. Um, I had just come off some medical leave when uh, Craig called and said, you want to go to lunch? I said, sure. And then he says, you want to go to work? And I said, oh, I don't know about that. And that was 16 years ago, so <laughs> I think he's kept me alive all these years. Um, in, in research projects, particularly randomized control uh, trials, um, you need a control condition that's for a couple of different reasons. One, to sh show that you're having an effect at all, but also um, as a comparator. So in this type of a trial, what we were looking at was using some kind of an existing practice, and you hear the term standard care and standard of care, and then there are slight differences. Um, standard care typically means treatment as usual, usual care, those are terms that are used in the literature to describe that type of a setup. Um, but if you have investigators that have different experience, different le levels of competence, or, or different approaches to things, and you want to try to have a consistent intervention, um, you have to come up with something that is, is more carefully controlled. So you might have to modify things, um, or even enhance them to inform, to make sure that you've got a uniform uh, approach and the quality of care. So standard of care implies that you've applied some sort of, of uh, clinical guidelines in order to keep things consistent. And that's what we did in this particular project. So we first looked at existing practices by surveying the military audiologists who were interested in participating in the trial. Uh, we did that twice. Bobby orchestrated most of those surveys and, and looked at the results. Um, and then we, we went ahead and, and compared them and contrasted them with, with a set of guidelines that we did have. Um, I happen to know about them because I was on the group that worked on this. Uh, and it was not just tinnitus, it was all types of audiology practices. So we did have some um, preferred practice patterns to use as guidelines. Um, and then the big challenge, uh, as Bobby mentioned earlier, was trying to figure out how do we script this because uh, our, our advisor at NIH, Gordon uh, Hughes, who's unfortunately no longer with us, kept saying to me, you know, it's got to be scripted. I said, well, how do, you deal, how do you counsel a patient using a script? They're all different. And uh, just serendipitously, I guess, I was uh, working on some other projects that involved looking at patient-centered care. And it is a process, and there are steps to it. So what we finally orchestrated was something that had a process that was uniform, but the content diff using the different options that were included in the standard, um, the preferred practice patterns and the, the things that people were already doing for tinnitus patients gave us some flexibility to be able to address the patient's individual needs. Uh, we got to train all of these people. Um, and then we had recorded practice sessions. They had a checklist that they would say, yes, I did this, yes, I did this. And Susan and I would review those and go, no, you didn't, no, you didn't, no, you didn't. And until they passed certification, um, we had to keep following them. And there were a few that stuck around for several sessions, but uh, most of them got it pretty good. And then we would do routine checks on each of the clinicians to make sure that they were adhering to the protocol. Um, the survey of audiologists showed things that most of us know are typical. Um, this is what they were saying to their patients or telling them uh, it's not life-threatening, again, assuming that a medical condition has been ruled out. Um, so there's nothing here that you know, was earth-shatteringly different uh, with this audiologist using the military population. So in terms of recommendations and everything, everything was pretty standard. So, ASHA gave us some guidelines. The management should be based on the patient's complaint, their history, their audiologic evaluation, and self-assessments. And this, again, is applying to people for whom medical uh, treatment has already been ruled out. Um, and then the, 
management of that sh could include any or all of the following. Counseling about the sources of tinnitus, um, because sometimes understanding something facilitates acceptance and adjustment to it. If you, you know it's not a brain tumor, it's just this, whatever's going on, you can accept it more readily. Um, obviously, the use of environmental sound uh, to aid in the reduction of tinnitus perception and uh, making sure that people understand that there are certain things that could exacerbate it or make it worse. Um, counseling to promote coping um, and minimize stress, minimize sleep problems, the typical kinds of things that we wanted to be sure we, we would cover. So, we adapted the goals that ASHA said were appropriate for tinnitus management to reduce the cognitive, affective, physical, and behavioral reactions to tinnitus and to improve their well-being and quality of life. Uh, the focus was not on habituation. The focus was not on the tinnitus signal per se. It was the impact that the tinnitus had on the individual's life. Okay. Patient-centered care is, is something that has evolved over the years, and these are just some of the people that I think have contributed concepts and ideas that, as audiologists, we don't run into every day, but are still very, very important. Um, Hippocrates, for example, said, it's more important to know what person the disease has than to know what disease the person has, okay? He also said, cure sometimes, treat often, comfort always. Carl Rogers, the empathy man, the person-centered therapy person. Did you know that he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize? I thought that was really cool. <laughs> anyway, he says, it's the client who knows what hurts, what directions to go, and which problems are crucial. Engel, have any of you heard of George Engel? George Engel was the first one to say that the medical model is flawed. And he pointed out some very significant issues with the medical model, one being that it doesn't include the whole person. Okay. Back when the medical model was evolving over the years, there was a separation of mind and body, okay? And Engel was the one to say, hey, let's put them back together, which was very important for work especially with people with chronic conditions where it's not, you know, go in, they fix it, and you go home and you're fine. You know, so for chronic conditions that are going to involve management, you, you need to understand the whole person. So Engel's, Engel's contributions in that area were really significant. Um, his, the need for a new medical model uh, article that came out in 77 has been cited over 11,000 times. It's just had a profound effect on how we look at health care throughout the system. And then you have Albert Bandura, an Iowa person, who said that the psych department here was not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, he uh, has contributed significantly to our, our concepts of reciprocal de determinism, which means person and their affective and cognitive states and their behavior and the environment are all interactive and they all have effects on one another. Engel's biopsychosocial model, which is what he proposed as an alternative to the medical model, views the person as a whole. And in that, he says that the patient's story is critical, okay, that that's what we should be addressing. And it's also important that the practitioner fo foster an empathic, trusting relationship uh, by understanding and by being understanding. And he also advocated for shared communication, decisions, and responsibilities, and engaging patients in the treatment plans. So his, his model really laid the groundwork for person-centered, patient-centered care. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, about the time that Craig recruited me for this project, I was working with some other people uh, on the biopsychosocial model and person-centered care and audiology treatment um, and was involved on the faculty at the Ida Institute for a, a seminar series that they called Patient-Centered Care, Fact, Fiction, or Fluff. And um, 
So the work that I did with the folks there was really instrumental in helping me conceptualize what we were doing. Um, and this is basically the model that my other colleagues and I have, have developed uh, to explain how this all works. Um, you elicit a patient's story. Empathy is your response to it, okay? Because that creates mutual validation, trust, and mutual understanding, which have to be the basis for having a committed therapeutic relationship and for shared decision making. I like to use the term collaborative decision making more than shared, because shared sometimes implies that you just think the same thing, and collaborative means you know you might have had to work to come to that solution. Good example. Um, I'm sure you've all had patients who've said, you're the expert, you tell me what to do. You know, what do you think is best? Okay, well, that's all good and well, except perhaps that's not something that's going to fit into that person's lifestyle. Perhaps it's not something that, that will work for them for whatever reason. So you have to kind of guide them to say, well, what will work best for you with this? Would this work or would that work? Or what do you think about this? And come up with something collaboratively that is going to be more likely to be used and adapted and therefore successful. Um, it has to be something that they're capable of doing, and this is why we'll talk about self-efficacy. And then you've enhanced the likelihood that the person will adhere to the treatment recommendation and achieve their goals and therefore have satisfaction with treatment and benefit. And all of this, of course, is likely to be dominant, predominantly subjective. Now with tinnitus, you know, Susan was mentioning, you know, there's a jillion people out there who have tinnitus who aren't bothered by it. You know, so what's different with that group that we're seeing that says this is a problem for me? If we can somehow help them see it differently than if they're having benefit from treatment, even if that's subjective, that's probably okay. So, just my theory on that. Why is the patient's story so critical? Patient narratives, just having somebody be able to get something off their chest can have a therapeutic effect. It encourages empathy. Uh, it promotes understanding. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, I, I, just, I don't have time for that. And there have been a couple of studies that, uh, that have been done that show eliciting a narrative versus doing a standard case history might take a minute longer. But the same studies have also shown that you have greater patient satisfaction if you invest that extra minute and, and get the narrative. The other thing about a narrative is that you're far more likely to hear the specifics that are relevant for that person, which you might miss in a standard check form. You know, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. But if the person tells you their story, what's going to come out are the, are the factors and the variables that are mostly significant for that individual. One of the things that we do in our training is to have people elicit stories from one another and just say, okay, tell me about how you get your hair done, you know. And the things that will come out will be totally different than, you know, what you could get in a yes or no, you know, how often do you get your hair cut or, you know, do you, do you color your hair, you know, different things like that. You, you're going to get the whole picture so the, this was part of our, our training too. Uh, and we do this with audiologists for all kinds of training things too, just to mostly help audiologists get over the notion that we're not counselors, okay? We are. So anyway, that's, that's the whole issue with, with narratives. Um, In terms of research, they do help also help generate hypotheses about things that you might not have thought of. All right, so in the script for the standard of care, uh, you explain that it's my goal to help you cope with your tinnitus so it doesn't have a negative effect on you in your life. To, but to do that, I need to understand how it affects you every day and how you feel about it. So we're not worried about which ear, we're not worried about how often, we're not worried about how loud, just saying, how is it affecting you? I can't help you with the problems that you have unless I understand how it's affecting you. So please tell me about your tinnitus. That's my introduction to the whole concept of empathy. <laughs> okay. Empathy is the heart of patient-centered care. Uh, it communicates our concern and our understanding. It promotes mutual validation, which is the foundation for having a trusting relationship with, with, between patient and practitioner. 
uh, and trust is associated with better adherence. So basically, empathy really, really enhances our treatment efforts. Um, what do I mean by mutual validation? Okay. If you respond empathically to someone and they say, gosh, this person really understands, okay? You're validated as a clinician, but you've also validated their experiences by being able to, to express how you feel and, and that you understood what it is that they're going through. God, this must be really frustrating for you. I can tell you've been putting up with this for a long time. And he's just like, wow, they got it. Um, so what are the components of empathy? Um, First, you have an accurate perception of what the person's going through or what their problem is. Um, you have an, an appropriate emotional reaction to it. You, you sense how, what they're feeling. And then your behavioral component is that you're able to reflect that back. Uh, it could be a gesture, you know, a sympathetic pat on the hand or the shoulder. Uh, it could be a statement, it could be both. But somehow or another, you have behaviorally communicated back to them your understanding of their situation. Uh, so once the person has summarized um, their issues with tinnitus, you say, okay, what I'm hearing is that you've been doing A and B and feeling C and D. Um, and from what you said, I can tell it's really been inf interfering in some important aspects of your life. It's really been getting you down. It's been really stressful for you. I can tell how frustrated you are. Statements of that type. Can it be taught? <laughs> um, there are a lot of different approaches to trying to teach people to be more empathetic. A huge part of it is listening and being mindful of what the person is telling you, taking the time to be mindful. You know, we, we, we're, we're all at a are being bombarded with so many things and are multitasking, but the, the, the primary focus is just on that individual at that point in time. A um, gal by the name of Helen Rice at um, Mass General uh, has a, a biomarker system and program, a training program. There's a, a great TED talk that she's done on empathy, the power of empathy. The Cleveland Clinic has put out um, an amazing series of, of videos that you can get on YouTube also. Uh, about empathy, and they're extremely helpful to watch and just give you a different sense of, you know, what do you, what do you look for when you're seeing your patients, and what, why is it so important to respond uh, empathetically? Clinically, we miss opportunities for empathy. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems for us is that as audiologists, what we see is pretty much the same kind of issues day in and day out. So we're kind of inured to it. You know, we don't, we don't react to it anymore. But to that person, it's still a big issue. So we may fail to recognize, you know, how stressful or concerned or upset somebody is. Um, another thing that we do is we tend to, to discount it or to minimize for, oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, you'll get used to this. And um, that's, a, that's another missed opportunity. And then another thing, of course, is, you know, well, we can fix that, okay? And, and sometimes, Fixing isn't what is as necessary as just being heard. And then the, the last thing too, especially with a lot of new students who say this to me is that I don't know what I'm supposed to say. So that's another one. Um, so your clinical problems may, may start to seem uh, unimportant and for sure we see that people with more complex problems tend to elicit more empathy. Um, maybe they just are more interesting to us or whatever. We're, we haven't seen them that often, so you know, we're not having just normal, typical reactions to it anymore. We're seeing something different. But apathy, boredom, all of these kinds of things, the fact that you think you don't have time to do this kind of thing it's, or it's not important, uh, I'm just here to fix this issue or tell them what to do and then they can go on their merry way and I can see my next person. Um, Another issue that comes up is, you know, if you, especially if you have chronic patients, that every time you turn around, they're at the, they're at the door again with a, another complaint. And then you, you start to build up some, some tension and frustration with those people. That can be an issue. Um, Rogers was a huge person who promoted the, the whole concept of, of effective listening and uh, the importance of empathy. And I think that the important focus here is, is you know, how, cr how critical that is in affecting change. You know, we don't realize how much we can 
do that just by the simple fact of having listened and understood. All right, so the next phase after you've um, empathized and the person has told you their story and you've identified their problems uh, is making some shared decision making. First about goals, you know, what is it that you need and what is it that you want to have, um, well, how do you want to uh, uh, treat this? So this is the process for collaborative decision making. You know your choices, you know your options. There are some controversies associated with um, shared decision making and that I mentioned earlier, having this, the person wants you to make the decision and how do you re-engage them in that process then? Are decision aids neutral? You know, there are a lot of brochures and things out that we tend to give patients, and are they neutral? In the scripted device, uh, in the script, we do cover anatomy and physiology. We do cover the audiogram to the extent that it's relevant to that person. If their eyes start to glaze over, we'll say, I say, move on, because you don't want to lose them. You've identified their problems, you've empathized with them, and they're ready to talk about those problems. So you want to explain things to make sure they don't have any misconceptions, clarify and verify to make sure you've got a, a good understanding of the problem and that they have a good understanding of the problem. Um, so we then talk about devices and options. These are all scripted into the, the format that we use. And again, pushing the whole concept of environmental sound. Once they've decided on whatever kinds of sleep devices or environmental sound they want or whatever kinds of changes they're going to make in their environment to, you know, I mean, we do, if, it's, if stress is a major issue, we demonstrate relaxation exercises. We give them handouts on that. We do attention shifting exercises to talk about concentration. We give them handouts on that. So this is all included in the script. But then the big question is, are they going to do it? Do they feel capable? So that's where the self-efficacy comes in. And you have to show them that whatever they've been doing so far that helped are the kinds of things that they should build on. So keep doing those things and add to them. They worked, and that's positive. So you're building on their other strengths. Believing in themselves and in their ability to do something is important because it affects how they approach tasks and how they set their goals, especially with respect to health care. If, if they don't believe in their ability to do something, they're probably not going to try or they're going to set themselves up to fail. Bandura's work and self-efficacy, and there have been some audiology papers by Sherry Smith and uh, others on hearing aid self-efficacy that are relevant to this and talk about mastery experience being the most important way to promote self-efficacy. Verbal persuasion, things that we can say to them, um, vicarious experience, seeing other peers do it or people that they respect, so even videos, um, role playing, all of these things are very helpful. Because whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. <laughs> um, these are the certification requirements to make sure that people were, were eligible to do the standard of care. They had to elicit a narrative, respond with empathy, identify the problems, engage the patient in, in the shared decision making, and promote self-efficacy. We had problems, people wanted to know what to do if, if they thought they were in the control group and say, well, it's, it's currently the best practice and we don't know if this other thing works anyway. Um, insufficient narratives, missed opportunities to empathize, uh, over-reliance on handouts and being too tentative because it was the control condition and not necessarily believing that it was going to be as good as TRT. So those were some of the issues. And when people ask me why I think the standard of care worked or why patient-centered care worked, that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Yep.